All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our third annual Innovation and in CP in the College of Public Service Symposium. Tonight we have a panel of seven faculty members who are gonna present on research and projects that, they've, that they're working on or have worked on as a result of winning awards, uh, grant awards uh, from the College of Public Service. So I'm gonna uh, introduce you to everyone. Uh, this right here is Dr. Kevin Buckler. He is uh, our, our faculty member from the Criminal Justice Department. This is Dr. Irene Chen from the Urban Education Department. This is Dr. Diane Miller from our Urban Education Department. This is the one and only Dr. Angela Goins from our social work faculty. This is Dr. Jace Valcour from our Criminal Justice Department. This is Dr. Shannon Fowler from our Criminal Justice Department and he is going to introduce this is Avica Marinovic, uh, a newly minted master's degree student from our CJ program. And he um, uh, worked with Dr. Fowler and he's gonna be presenting uh, uh, tonight, this evening. So I am going to start our presentation. Uh, and before, I, before we start, let me just, in case those of you who don't know, we do have food in the back. And if you don't need it, I will. So please help yourself to food. Uh, and we're gonna start with Dr. Miller. Good evening. Thank y'all all for coming out tonight. This is great. Um, so the project that Mr. Villano asked for me to speak with you about tonight is called Camino a la Universidad, and that means path to university. And it's what we call a next generation mentoring project. So um, let's go back a little bit so you'll understand how it came to be. I'm a literacy teacher, so I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, so my last two years of teaching in K through 12, before I finished my doctorate and came to UHD, I was at a middle school in Northwest Houston, and it's now a Title I middle school. And of course, as teachers do, we've kept up with each other, all the teachers there and, and, and me, when I, even when I left. And so um, after I'd been at UHD a couple of years, my friend Mariella Delgado called me and she said, so Diane. How are you liking this new university gig you have? And I'm like, well, it's, it's different. It's a hard work, but it's different. And she said, no, well, I don't want to talk about that. I'm like, okay. And she said, I saw on the website that you're a Hispanic serving institution. I said, well, yes, we are. And she said, well, so you've got students who are Latinas. And I said, I do. And she said, well, I've got Latinas who need to be mentored, so we're gonna do something together. <laughs> and so she had it in her mind that she really wanted to support um, girls that she kind of saw her own face in, you know, she said, I wish somebody had talked to me when I was in seventh or eighth grade about college and about how to attack high school and all of that. And she said, so that's what I wanna do for these girls. Um, and the best people to talk to these girls are going to be Latinas who have also made accomplishments in their lives and they're now going to college. So that's how it was born. Um, and uh, so we have about 26 seventh and eighth grade girls, and she chooses them, some by teacher um, uh, nomination, some that she knows that who need a little bit of extra push. And uh, what we do, is, uh, we've got five UHD students who all agree to mentor these girls, and they, we meet with them twice a month. And uh, my UHD students, in your handout you can see um, several of the objectives that I have for both. Obviously for the middle school mentees, we're trying to get them to consider alternate behaviors than maybe what they were engaging in. We're trying to get them to think about college as they're entering high school because we know that your grades from ninth gra day one, ninth grade follow you. And so if you don't start thinking about college till the end of your junior year in high school, it's kind of too late sometimes and you gotta do some patch up work to get there, right? So um, we're really wanting them to get into that mindset that they can do whatever they set their minds to do. Um, so that's for the middle school students. We're also working on communication skills with them, character building lessons, things like that. Um, and the, the cool thing for the UHD mentors on the flip side of it is that they are all studying to be teachers. And so as pre-service teachers, um, they do have 
two semesters of 60 hours each of field experience, and then they have their student teaching um, the semester that, in which they graduate. But all of those are pretty high pressure situations in learning how to teach. Somebody's coming and observing you, you're with a cooperating teacher, she's telling you, you did this wrong on the lesson, you did this wrong on the lesson, do this better, all that. So that's a lot of pressure. So this is kind of a cool opportunity for the UHD students to, number one, the first answer that they always give me is that they want to give back to their community and they wish somebody like them had talked to them when they were in seventh and eighth grade. The same reason that Mary Ella gave me for starting the program in the first place. Um, but then they get to try out teaching techniques and ideas and things like that in a very low pressure atmosphere. If a lesson bombs or if they do some fun activity with the girls that really didn't end up being that fun or whatever, it's fine. The girls are glad to get there. They have um, that one class period with us twice a month and they get a snack and water and they get to hang out with each other and they get to talk through some of their issues. And we've done a very, um, good job, I think, of building a community in which there's a lot of trust. And so part of that, it's, it's been interesting for me um, because I'm a white woman. I don't know if you noticed. Um, so I am not the mentor, and I want to be very clear about that because the program is built to support these girls where they are with somebody who understands their background and who maybe has a story similar to theirs. And so I just make sure if they need red yarn for an activity, they've got red yarn for the activity. Or if I need to make copies for them, that's what we make copies for them. And I kind of stay in the periphery. I also help the UHD mentors plan their lessons. So there's some instructional coaching going on. Both Mariella and myself will review the lessons before they do it with the girls and say, Sometimes they listen to us, sometimes they don't. Um, for instance, there was this one time and they planned lesson, Mary Ellen and I looked at each other and we we're like, that's not gonna take the whole period. There's gonna be a lot of dead time at the end. I'm like, no, 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 it's gonna take the whole time, 45 minutes. We were sitting there, had 20 minutes left over. We're like, mm-hmm. Told you. So they, um, it's, it's nice to be able to really fine tune the lessons with them and they get a real sense of timing, which is important for teachers and to really understand how to go through a class period without the pressure of if they don't learn this, they won't do well on star test, you know? So there's, there's a really neat interaction going on there. So what else, what else do I want to tell you? So the really cool thing about it is, so we do the twice a month mentoring sessions, right? And of course the UHD students have to go through criminal background checks and then they go through the mentor training for the district. Um, but then at the end of the year we do a university tour day and that's really cool so the girls we all get in school buses well i follow the school bus in my car but anyway we get on school buses and we come down here to the downtown campus for half a day and they do like a mini fitness test up there at, at the wellness center and they meet like the university president we've had one of the members of the board of regents come and meet with them and they really get to see and feel and they even eat here at the college and experience that. Several of them have never been downtown before each year. Um, you think living in Northwest Houston, you know what a downtown looks like, but um, a lot of these girls have never been out of their their area of Houston where they grew up. So that's a huge experience. And then we take the buses and we go back to the Northwest campus, which um, shows them that they could stay close to home, do Lone Star for two years and finish at the UHD classes um, and, and never have to leave home. And so, and then we go back to the school at the end of the day. So that's the university tour day. And it's just fabulous seeing all the opportunities. The Lone Star admissions people come talk to them and do a little lesson with them. And they get to do some 3D printing in their innovation lab. And it's just a great day to acquaint them with higher education because we've done some demographics on the girls and most of them, no, like only a couple of them, their parents have gone to college, and so this is a pretty new atmosphere and environment for them. And if they are able to encounter this environment and see that it's safe and welcoming and see that there's a very big place for them here, um, there's a lot of encouragement as they go into high school. Um, I remember President Munoz came and talked to them, I guess it was two times ago, and uh, this we're in our fourth year of doing it now, and uh, he put his hand on the table and he said, ladies, this is the university president speaking to you. I am inviting you to come to my school and until another university president looks you in the eye and says, come to my school, then you have to come to my school because I'm the only one who's done that. So he said, you have a personal invitation to come to my school. So, okay. And uh, they, 
they love the gators and they get little squishy gators and we have t-shirts that say Camino a la Universidad and it has the their their mascot up at the top and it has a little road and it goes down to the UHD gators so they can see that that's their path to university um, and then Two years ago, uh, President Munoz gave us a little bit of extra money and we did a fine arts day with them last spring. And so we um, took them to City Center. We had a three course uh, lunch. That was after we'd had an etiquette lesson at school and learned how to use which fork when and all of that stuff. Um, and then we went to, uh, we had that three course lunch. Actually the president's wife was our guest speaker. And um, so we all sat in there in this room at Seasons 52 restaurant bawling and boohooing and crying because she said, y'all are me. And, and I'm so glad that you're thinking about college right now. And it was just a beautiful experience then. And then we went to see a play, we went to see a musical. And for many of the girls, it was their first time to see a live action theater production. And so we had to talk about that the songs were very important to the storyline. And so we got them all acquainted with that. And, um, it's just been a great experience and so it's a little bit of a drop I mean it's only about 20 students a year but um, the coolest thing about it is is that my lead mentor from the past two years is now at um, U of H she got her she's doing her master's in social work we lost her she decided she didn't want to be a teacher through this program she wanted to be a social worker so <laughs> lost her to the social work department but she is now coming back as one of her social work projects from UH main campus um, to work with our high school girls so the girls the eighth graders from our first year are now juniors in high school. And so Selena is going and meeting with them once a month to really talk turkey about college, like how to apply, FAFSA, all those kind of details that are a little bit too in the weeds if you're in seventh and eighth grade, right? So, um, but now they're interested in it because they're juniors and it's, it's time for them to start thinking about all that. So that's it. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. We don't get into that as much yet because, like I said, they're seventh and eighth graders. And so um, we toyed with that idea of really getting into the specifics about financial aid, but it just didn't seem appropriate because we were trying to craft a more effective student experience for them going into high school. And then that's, I think, more what Selena's thinking about doing with them this spring is bringing in some financial aid and admissions counselors to come in and talk to the juniors in high school, the ones who started with us that very first year. But it just didn't seem to fit. It's too much too soon kind of a thing. Like anything we tell them in seventh, eighth grade, you need to follow this form when or whatever. Or here's where you can go. We talk generally about scholarships. We talk generally about writing skills and that that's necessary for scholarship acquisition and things like that. But we don't get into a whole lot of specifics with them. Good question. Any, anyone else have another question for Dr. Miller? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, I see where you have uh, social work preparation on the back of your flyer. Can you go in depth and explain to me a little bit more about like what the actual social workers do? What are you talking about? Where are you talking about? Um, on the mentors. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 oh. That is more just thinking about their social barriers that they face daily. And those are happening a lot with the conversations, the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so that was a comment from what that senior mentor who's now in social work, and she wanted to put that on the list. We did this presentation um, in the spring, which is really why I'm here tonight. Um, Selena, my lead mentor, and um, Mariella both, both went with me to a national conference in the spring, and we presented on that. But she felt like it was preparation to pursue social work as a career because doing this mentoring project is what turned her on and she to social work and she decided she didn't want to be a teacher anymore. So that's that's where that's coming from. It was whole her whole career shift. And I think that's her quote that says Camino a la Universidad helps these girls find themselves, but it helped me find myself too. And she very much realized that that's what she was meant to do. So I think that's what it is. Not social work specifically, but preparation to be engaged with it and to be interested in it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? 
And what I love about this is that, so as, as Dr. Miller said, so she's, the, all the faculty are engaging with not only their students, but they're engaging with the community. And that's what we want our college to be about. We want our college to be about service, about engaging, not being in some ivory tower as the cliche goes. And here you have a student who is in education but realizes that, wait a minute, this might not be the right fit. That's the time to find that out through these kinds of experiences that the professors offer. So thank you, Dr. Miller, very much. So now I, uh, we are gonna pass the microphone to Dr. Fowler and um, we will talk about his student-led project in program evaluation and implementation, a key for juvenile rehabilitation and social integration. Hi, good evening, thanks for being here. Uh, so I supervised Mr. Marinovic, and so uh, I'll let him explain his project best. Um, my role was really to support him, uh, guide him, advise him. So I really want him to explain what he did for this CARES grant. Uh, so the CARES grant uh, for, from the college allows uh, student reimbursement costs for travel to a conference. So uh, Mr. Marinovic took his research findings and traveled to a national conference and presented them uh, at ASC, American Society of Criminology, in San Francisco this past November. But uh, he approached me uh, as he was earning his externship uh, with a local juvenile justice agency. And so an externship is a nice way of saying paid internship such that you have to link your experience in the agency with coursework. And so that's what uh, he and I were working on. And then he used that experience for his research project uh, for his graduation. And so I, I think I've set up enough and I'll uh, turn the mic over to him so that he can explain what he did. And also, uh, if you got a packet at the front door before you walked in, there's some stapled pages in there with uh, two slides per page. And so that is for this particular presentation that he put together. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being here. I enjoyed this project because I want to do something in the field, so I want to connect academic side with a practical side and put them together. And it worked wonderful, I really enjoy it because I was able to see the multiple sides of the, co of the same corner and it gives a better picture. So I want to start with a quote that I really like is, you actually have in your packets as well, it says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And the quote itself, it's powerful for me. Examination, evaluation. It's a good for, for a way. It explains not only for the individuals itself, but you can put it organizations, families, individuals, organizations, societies. How often do we evaluate what we do? How often we go back and say, does something work or does something doesn't work? And then go back if something doesn't work, how we fix it. And that was my project. I was really interested in the juveniles program evaluation. So I was interested in the programs used by the juvenile probation and basically evaluate. I was evaluating the multisystemic therapy. I was evaluating individual counseling, group counseling, uh, the special need diversionary program. And instead of looking at the recidivism rates, I was looking more at the criminogenic risk factors. So I was, I was interested to see, does the program has effect on aggression? Does the program has effect on attitudes, behaviors, skills, education, or mental health? So does those programs have effect on those things? And if you go to those slides, there's a always a good thing in this. It's a, I try to pull, when I look into the data, again, I don't want to use one way. So what I have done is actually approach it from multiple angles again. One of those was, I was using the, the positive achievement pack tool assessment instrument they use for the kids. So basically when the kids go into the juveniles, they 
file those sections, the 12 sections, each section, and then before they leave, they have the same obligation to do so. So I was able to evaluate the very first and the very last one and see the differences. But not only that, I actually went on and administered a survey to program therapists, and I asked them the questions about adherence to the program. I asked them about the quality of the program implementation, exposure, and actually about the juvenile's participants' responsiveness to the treatment itself. I was able to work there, kind of external evaluator, which is a nice thing to be there, to see how the organization functions. There's one thing about observations, I love them. Uh, you see and hear the things, you usually wouldn't do it. And it's a nice thing, I haven't actually included there, it wasn't part of my research, but it's a wonderful tool, kind of try to blend everything together. And put them in the nice, in the, in a, in kind of, Nicely in the paper to see, okay, this is how things are. So the, the results itself are, there's a few important points. One of those points was that like in the case of the group therapy, they actually have a negative, significant negative effect on aggression. However, when you, once you control for the initial result, there is no any more significance, which simply indicates few possible points. One of the possible point is that kids with the low aggression get into the treatment and get mixed with the low aggression kids, they might become aggressive themselves. Aggressions can spread to the treatment. So basically, this research already has confirmed the problematic placing the low level offenders with the high level offenders. In the case of aggression, can have a, a significant impact on the kids. The second thing that this project has been kind of brought into light is that overall, no program regardless effectiveness or program implementation of fidelity has significant statistical impact on the kids. Basically means it doesn't make kids worse, but even no better. So we kind of reach there in the middle, what you do with this. So I, you know, I put you there, you are no, neither nor worse nor better. So you are basically stay the same. And the third point was, which was for me kind of interesting, was the point, was the point of, there is a big sh shift in the program evaluation that we like to turn toward the more complex interventions, intensive interventions, and there is a belief they work better than less structured interventions. And for example, multisystemic therapy, which is a very intensive, very structured intervention, in terms of the skill, doesn't perform, actually performs less desirable compared to the individual counseling or the group therapy. And if you look at MST and SNDP, both structured intensive interventions, and compare them against the group therapy, individual counseling, there is really no statistical significance. Basically, they might have effect on the small number of the kids, but there is no aggregate or cumulative effect. Which is good, I mean, it doesn't make them, but at the same time, the question becomes, do we want them better when they leave those institutions? And the final point is, so now we know from this research basically, does that make them better, nor does that make them worse? The question is now why? And this was the beautiful qualitative data that comes into the play. This is when those interviews come into the play, that when the survey comes into the play. I actually also grew up in orphanage as a kid, so I can even see the point of the kids. And as I went through all this qualitative data, I was looking for the common items, common terms, that come up with the interviews that comes through the surveys and everything. And there's a few things that come up. One of those things that was really interesting is the lack of adequate specific job education. Agency does provide a wonderful opportunities for many people to learn, to improve, but not job related. A lot of training and teaching occurs outside the juvenile agencies, which means it's very expensive to go outside and train the, youth, the, the therapist and who pays for that. 
they're often not, not cheap. They cost a lot of money. Another point that was very interesting for me was that there's a few therapists working a large geographical area, which is another thing that definitely has effect. MST has only like eight therapists working with a lot of juveniles. Other ones has only four therapists. So you have a 12 therapists working, covering a large area. Another thing was that I think is a very important point is that are the interventions culturally sensitive? MST, for example, doesn't perform as you would expect it. The question now becomes, in, our, in my sample, there was 60% Latinos, 35% black, 5% white. Now the question becomes, are these interventions created for the culturally sensitive people? Actually, both, quite a few supervisors told me actually, they said, it's very hard to sell the interventions to the families. They simply want to turn them to the agency, fix them and return them home. And could be cultural. There's a, maybe some, some culture simply see the intervention itself as something not culturally acceptable. Mine is one. I come from Croatia, and if you go to the therapist, it's seen it the wrong way. There is, there is a culture. My culture is that way. People, stigma, bias, we sometimes try to get those away. And another point I think that's important is the point that there is a, a burnout among the therapist. It's, it, it, it's just a reality, they're, they're in a burnout. There is a moderate to high burnout among them, which then can they actually have a negative effect on the treatment itself. And the last point I just want before I end is the, is the fact that many of these interventions, unfortunately, pass and go without ever being evaluated. And that's a sad thing. That's really sad thing that we put so many kids into these interventions and very few are ever evaluated. And that was the, I hope, going through this research, the agency may get some incentivizement and, and they're doing a good job, they really try to improve it, but it's one of those really challenging things. How do you improve it, something that doesn't make better or worse, so, and thank you. Thank you. So you are attending graduate school, you've completed graduate? You completed. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations is right. Yes, congratulations. Fresh graduate, December. December. Wow. Great. I would have thought you were uh, teaching in this faculty already. <laughs> Great job. Any questions? Anyone have a question? You have a question? What do you want to ask? How does bees? How does bees? How does bees make honey? <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that, actually. Um, I'm going to have to think about that for a while, okay? Hmm. That's tough. You're a good questioner. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Let, is, let us go, if there are no questions, to Dr. Valcour. And Dr. Valcour is going to be presenting on presidential hate speech, a critical analysis of Trump campaign and rally speeches from 2015 to 2018 using Asquith's criminal hate speech framework. Dr. Valcourt. Uh, good evening, can you all hear me? If everyone can make sure you keep the microphone almost in your, on your lips. All the way up here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this is an ongoing project. Um, um, two papers will be coming out of it. The first one is currently under review at a journal. Um, the impetus, um, as I'm sure anyone who pays attention to what's going on in this country in the past few years, um, I mean, especially starting back in like 2016, there was a lot of attention to, um, for the unusual nature of the campaign rhetoric being used by our now president um, it wasn't, historically, it wasn't unusual at all. Um, but there was a lot of talk about it <coughs> representing hate speech and to what degree it was inciting hate-based violence and things like that in the country. There's a lot of headlines, I'm sure you've seen over the past few years about that. Um, so this was an attempt to, you know, scientifically, systematically evaluate that 
Um, and I just so happened to have a colleague in Australia who had developed a verbal textual hostility typology um, several years ago while she was doing work for the London Metropolitan Police Department. She analyzed, it was over 20,000 um, incident reports from them on hate incidents, which is different um, for them than for us. So they evaluate and investigate far more incidents of hate related um, bias motivated crimes than we do in the US. Um, and her task um, was to evaluate the different utterances and, and things st stated, said by the offenders, by other people involved in these incidents. Because police in London will track incidents of hate speech with the assumption or the, in hopes that they can prevent it from turning into violence. So they track a lot more of this than we do in the, in the US, which is why there was over 20,000 different incidents that she was able to analyze. And if you have the handout, which I'm not sure very many people got, um, you can see that typology on the back of it. The first several categories that are in all capitalization are, is her original typology, um, Dr. Nicole Asquith is her name, based on that London report that she did. And then there's a couple at the bottom and lowercase that we added when we applied this typology to um, Trump's campaign and rally speeches. So that was the idea of this. Um, basically, um, so I guess it's important to note that verbal textual hostility is not the same thing as hate speech. Um, these are just types of speech that were used in hate incidents. Um, some of it qualifies as hate speech, some of it does not. Um, but basically we just took this typology and applied it. So a, a typology from a criminal incident and applied it to political um, campaign speech. It also will allow us to compare the difference between um, criminal related speech and, and campaign speech. Um, it'll allow us to look at different contexts like the US context versus the UK. Um, because we are, we do stand out, we are unique in this among our peer countries, other Western global North nations. We are the only one that does not have any attempt at regulating hate speech because of our First Amendment, which is unique to us. Um, so we used, um, if you're not aware, there is a public, uh, publicly available database called the American Presidency Project um, that you, anyone can access. You don't even have to have UHD library access. You can just go to the website. Um, and you can download all kinds of presidential documents and speeches from you know, decades and decades. Um, so we just used that. We were able to pull 90 campaign and rally speeches from 2015 to 2018. Um, and we used a qualitative software program called InVivo in order to do the analysis. Um, and that's why I needed the grant, because I needed an updated version of that software um, to match the ones that my colleagues in Australia had. Because the my old version didn't work with their new version. And it was kind of a hitch in the project. Um, so basically, we started off just by applying the original typology to the speeches. Um, and then conversation among the three of us um, revealed that there was some other categories, other themes popping up that needed to be identified. Um, and so that we added domination, which is all of the racist, nativist, and white supremacist speech. And then deprecation, which was um, the habit of criticizing and ridiculing um, specifically the U.S. Um, as well as others. Um, and then we gave a name, we gave a formal name to the name calling. Um, there was not previously a name for that and I came up with denigration. So now there's a fancy name for that one. Um, so what did we learn from doing this? Um, well, <laughs> um, perhaps not surprising, um, Trump used 
every single category of verbal textual hostility in his campaign speeches except for sexualization. Um, that's the only one. Uh, maybe it's come up since, though. Um, but he does all of it. His favorites, however, um, were criminalization, domination, um, expatriation, and then also another big one was deprecation. Um, and that was not, we haven't thoroughly analyzed that category yet. So in the first paper, we just analyzed criminalization, domination, and expatriation, um, which criminalization is when he's calling people liars and cheats and criminals. Um, expatriation is when you're talking about um, exiling people from space, so kicking people out of your country or jurisdiction or space, whatever it is. Um, a lot of times in a hate crime incident that is a smaller scale, right? You're just talking about kicking someone, out, removing someone from your neighborhood or bar or whatever the incident is. Um, and then domination, this is the one that is particularly historically relevant um, when he uses a lot of phrases that you can point to in history, um, like America first, um, which was a previous KKK slogan. And a lot of the um, phrases that, and stuff that he would use that were kind of dog whistles to the white nationalists and white supremacists that were um, eerily similar to the campaign rhetoric used by Hitler. Like, you may have seen headlines about this kind of stuff, but it's not speculation, it's actually true. Um, and so, you know, our evaluation just adds to that factual um, basis for, for those kinds of statements um, that you may have seen in the media. Um, so, I mean, how much time do I have? All right, cool. So, I, I threw in a couple of direct quotes from the first paper as far as what I learned and what the implications of this are. Um, the, I mean, the, I guess the biggest thing is that unlike individual hate crimes, which tend to be the focus of, you know, one-on-one -on -one interpersonal interactions where someone hates another person, um, when a, a president or any kind of national figure, government figure in particular, makes these kinds of statements, it, it has the authority of the state behind it. And there was a, there still is, um, I guess a lot of a talk and assumption that, oh, it is just talk, it's just rhetoric, that's all it is. But if you point to these things, like we, we get to in our paper about immigration and banning Muslims and all of that stuff, he has put all of it into policy. It was never just rhetoric. Um, so that's, I guess, the key takeaway as far as policy implications. Um, what I learned, um, challenges and stuff, qualitative analysis is time consuming, I already knew that, that wasn't new. Um, emotional stress of doing this kind of work, I really need to quit doing this kind of work because it's taking a toll. Um, I study a lot of hate crimes and hate speech and LGBTQ treatment and it's always difficult. We even joked about it among ourselves, why are we choosing to read all of this stuff? Um, good question, why did we do that? Um, so yeah, that's the takeaway from the first paper. The second one, we'll, we'll start looking more at um, the other categories that are specifically unique to the political context like deprecation um, and things like that. All right, thank you. <laughs> Questions for Dr. Valcour. Dr or soon to be. Thank you for the, for the informative talk. I'm just wondering, based on your, based on the work that you've done with the speeches and the campaign rally speeches, if you were to apply the same framework to his tweets, what might you find? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we actually thought about that in the very beginning. Um, figuring out what the, what the sampling frame for this would be. And we, and we decided not to do tweets because that would just be too much. Um, 
And I, I actually think there may have, there probably, I think there is a, another study that's or a couple different people who are trying to look at the tweet situation. I assume we would find the exact same thing. I don't think it would be um, any different. There might be more of one category or another because of the nature of a short little tweet and that it is his personal thoughts at 3 a.m. and not a campaign speech, but I still think I, there's, a, there's little doubt that we would find all of it there. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm far back. Um, okay. Hi. Um, so, uh, how do we move forward? Uh, what I guess uh, this study is—it's it's amazing, but what um, kind of ramifications or, or even um, implications for like future campaigns would you like to see? Um, well, this is a. I mean, big picture, and this is something my, I have my undergrads talking about this week, the issue of, of campaign rhetoric and hate speech and all of that. In the U.S. context, um, there's just this very, very, very strong belief on the First Amendment and that we cannot regulate speech because that is a threat to our democracy. Um, from what I'm learning and reading, the more I get into the hate speech stuff, because it's, it's typically outside of what we do in criminal justice, because it's not a crime. It's not regulated. Um, but it's so highly related to what I do. I'm starting to get more into it. Um, you know, I'm, there's, there's work on the harms of hate speech being almost identical as the harms of hate crimes like physiologically, mentally, emotionally, culturally, socially has the same impact. The only difference is that you're not hitting the person. That's it, you know. Um, so why do we preference physical violence over verbal violence? Um, if the effects of hate speech are silencing people, and the First Amendment is supposed to give people a voice, so are we contradicting ourselves here? Like, are, are we actually, I don't know, I can't answer that. Um, um, I think it's a conversation that, for this country, it's going to take a really, really long time to uh, figure out. Other questions? I think a good idea would be to, in the future, see how much of this toxic rhetoric is, you know, permeating other sectors of society, and how much of this is becoming a reality. I think that when I, I was laughing, but I believe that when I was listening to the news, and now Trump is saying that what Nancy Pelosi did by ripping up the, the speech was, illegal and she should be prosecuted and it's totally false but I believe how many people now are going to start believing that what she did was actually a crime which it wasn't. I mean the, the, the crime is only to rip the original document but not the copies, you know. But but that that kind of toxic rhetoric, I want to see how much it becoming real and how much is this Primarily in other, other sectors of society. Can I yeah. make a comment on? Just, just wanted to make a comment on that. I think we have some pretty significant data, especially in terms of Islamophobia, hate crimes. So whenever he has said something about disparaging Muslims, the hate crimes against Muslims have actually gone up. And there is, you know, I mean, there's data to show correlation in, in that sense. So I, I don't think we are very far away from, you know, it permeating other uh, dimensions of society and actual incidents of violence going up. Yeah, there's um, actually a study that just came out last year. It was in the headlines. Um, and it was done by some faculty in Texas um, at University of North Texas and at uh, Texas A&M. 
um, and they analyzed incidents of hate violence in the counties in which Trump held a rally, comparing before and after. Um, they accounted for all kinds of factors like uh, Jewish population, the existing crime rate, education, all of that, and found in every single county a massive spike in hate-related violence after one of his rallies. So yeah, the science is, is coming out. Um, it's not just speculation anymore. We're seeing that it's real. Um, but again, the political will of this country to do something about it is a different issue. Anyone else? I have a question. So, when, did I understand you to say that? So, if Trump says "America first in a speech, that's domination. But that's domination because he's a figure of the state. Is that is that what you're saying? Um, in other words, for anyone saying "America first" would not be considered. But because if any a public official saying that, um, no. Okay, so. So domination, um, broadly, I mean, it's the term that we best came up with to, to label this category of speech. And it's all of the racist nativism and white supremacist speech that he uses. It, it all falls together. It's all connected historically, culturally. And it's all about dominating and subjugating other groups of people. Um, so... A lot of it has to do with keeping immigrants out, with keeping them out, the wall, building the wall, um, and then a lot of the stuff that he says, like America first and make America great again, that have direct racist and white supremacist connections as well. Um, so that's where it comes from. Anyone can say those things and use those things. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The, the implication is that when he does it, it's different. Because he is the president. And there, he has the, it's not just, oh, I hate you. It's, I can put the entire force of the US government against you. Like, that's what makes it different. So it's the implication. Yes. OK, great. Thank you. All right, let us move to Dr. Chen. All right, we will change gear to education. Uh, I am a professor of urban education, teaching educational technology. And then I am going to talk about a project. It's a tongue twister, I know, uh, teach tech ball, OK? So I promise, sometimes I will refer you to TTB to make it shorter. All right, first, I want to show you a picture. OK, look at this. This is a picture that I took in the class, and then it doesn't look like your everyday classroom, right? Because in the picture, students were very engaged. They even stood up to see what's showing on the display, okay? That is because at that time, we were playing a game called Kahoot. All right, Kahoot game. Make people, make students very excited. And we have little ones in, the, in, in, in this audience, so you will see that they like games. They play games, and they, it's very engaging, okay? So I, in the same spirit, I was trying to recreate to make this last longer, repeat itself, and then this is the contest that I came up with, all right? The rationale, I was about to talk about the student engagement, and also the purpose for this uh, Teach Tech Ball activity, the contest is for students to be more interested in turning in project, uh, technology project. I am teaching ETC 3301, and then there are about seven sessions total, and I don't teach every single one, but there will be other instructors, most of them adjunct professor. So sometimes it creates some variance, like uh, this class expect lower, quality than the other one sometimes because you know teach teachers instructors they have different uh, different kind of expect expectation so this following contest will invite te uh, technology instructors to evaluate other project that means that they have opportunity to see uh, the quality of other project okay so in, in addition to student expectation then instructors familiarity with the with the quality is also one of the reason for this contest 
all right? All right, so semesters, the fall semester of 2018 and spring semester of 2019. This contest was offered in each of the semester. And then there were four categories that we, we asked, we invited all the students taking the, the ETC course during those two semesters to participate. The first category is e-story, okay? If you have taken, taken any uh, literacy class, reading class, writing class, you would know that e-story is very important. This is a signature assignment that we want every student, every future teacher to be able to do very well. So this is the very first category that I came up with. Making the teachers will create stories, but the story will be technology-based. Okay, the second category will be images. Okay, you know memes and the cartoons, those kind of thing. The third category is very, it's more complex. The web pages, the blogs, they belong to the same category. The last one is animation, all right? Uh, by using those free tools, free online tools, our students cannot com create those complicated, sophisticated projects. However, there are some free software uh, technology tools that teachers can use and the, teach themselves quickly. All right, so there are four categories, and then I will see how much time that I have that I can show you a little bit of those. All right, so those four categories are picked, and then student they can uh, they can volunteer they, to to put their projects on there. Okay, and there's a website I will show you. I created a website as an invitation, so that student will see the announcement, the rules, the guidelines, and then other things. All right, and then can click on one of the link to go to this submission page. And there are four up, four categories. They can choose to turn in one or two or three or four, any of those options, All right? So this is an online, uh, online website. And then I will only take files online. It should be on the website. If the files is too big, then uh, they will have to do the Dropbox or other ways so that I can see them, okay? All right, so this is the, the place for students to submit their project. And then uh, this is the first example. In the e electronic story category, this is the first example. I don't think I have time to show you a lot. I will just probably show you one or two slides just for you to see. All right, this is an e-story. And then I'm going to click on this hyperlink. Hope that I can get back. Okay, the, the tool's name is Story Jumper. And then our students have come up with a storyline put together those images together, right? And that has to match. It has to, I mean, illustration is very effective to deliver the content. So I'm going to show this dedication page. Okay, so this is the hero, heroine of the story. And then this student was cr talking about this little girl who will have a big dream. All right, so this is the second page, the third page, and then the story were written by the student herself. The illustration were picked by the student herself. All right, so I think I will stop here just to give you a taste of the, the story. And then the, our students are creating the children's literature, the, the story for their future student. And then we do a lot of this, all right? The student can pick books for their student, the future K-12 student, but the same, by the same token, they can create stories for their future student. All right, so I'm going to quit from here and then show you the next one, the next category. Animation, there are some websites that helps our future teachers to create animation. And then this is different from the PowerPoint that you see every day. Okay, I click there. And this is linking to an external site called Powtoon. And you will see a video kind of animation. Actually, our student put together component, blocks, component, individuals, and then uh, create the, the, the file with background, with animations, with content. All right, so this is, pretty this is pretty complex for them. They learn this because this is not PowerPoint. This is something above and, uh, uh, above and beyond PowerPoint. All right, so you will see that it's cartoon-like, but for them it's not just some, some other tool they learn, okay. DAP, developmentally appropriate practice. All futures teachers know this term, right, the DAP. 
Okay, one more second, then I'm going to quit from here. So this is not your same old, same old PowerPoint. This is animation. I'm going to quit from here. All right, the third category. I like memes, I like cartoons, I like to see all of those. Okay, read a little bit of those texts. Punchline, <laughs> okay, they match the punchline they come up with, with, uh, with a background, okay, to match the word with background. And uh, our student, our future teachers, they like Dr. Seuss a lot. So I rotate the topic from semester to semester. That semester is the Dr. Seuss quote, okay? And there are some websites the student can go there and they don't even have to type, they just copy and paste batch with some interesting background and make a twist. The humor is very important, okay? Of course, I also remind them to be culturally sensitive so that they won't upset a big part of the audience, right? Okay, so just, uh, this is uh, interesting. Very easy to put together, but uh, it's a lot of fun to, to do. This is a fun project. The number four, Weebly, if you go to uh, your your kids uh, school open house, you will see lots of teachers use Weebly. And our future teachers also are learning how to create one with good content, structure, and also they also have to think about the growth of the website, okay? Because as the semester move along, there will be more and more and more adding up to the homepage. So this is what they are learning to structure, to organize, to make this navigation easy for, for, their par for the students' parents, those kind of thing. All right, the menu starts from here. And you can see about contents and the calendars and other things. And then, uh, so they learn how to create a homepage this way. All right, I'm going to quit from here. So we will come to this, logistics. Okay, after the student turned their projects, I invited those instructors, the ETC 301 instructors to be the judges. All of those are invited, they are, in, in, they are involved with this. So it, by this way, the instructors are aware of the expectation of other classes, so everybody will be more onto the same page, all right? Also, they know the potential of students, what they can do. So I think that's a good thing for us to say, okay, the other class is doing this, why don't we do that? And also, gift cards, yes. The contest winners will be awarded a gift card, all right? And the student can go to purchase things with the gift card. I didn't specify that I would like any kind of gift card for student. However, our college, they like a Walmart gift card, so they purchase the gift card. And then the staff, okay, the college administrators, they help me distribute the gift card for student to come and pick up, hand give to the student so that I do not have to be involved with giving and staying in the office at all. And I really have to, to thank the staff members for helping me with uh, administration. Encouragement, not acknowledgement is also very important, okay? So uh, when I send them the email announcement to, to the student, at the same time, I send this electronic certificate so that they can put in their electronic portfolio. This is a great, I mean, this is greatly appreciated because when they apply for a job, this kind of thing really proves that they can do things. They are the contest winners, okay? So they like this a lot. And then I make sure that every single student have one of those. It's in colors. I just use a PowerPoint a certificate template to create this. All right, so I want you to enjoy, look at this and enjoy that. The typos are intended, it's not by mistake, okay? So read that and uh, you can have some fun with this. All right, you got it? All right, so I like this a lot. And then while I was showing you, those four projects are not, probably not the, the, the contest winners. I just picked those, they represent the, each of the categories, okay? So if you are not education major, at least you know what we are doing. And we are trying very hard to reach the millennials, right? The digital natives, so that, that's what teachers are doing, trying to catch up with the, with the, the newest generation of student population. All right, thank you for your time. Right, and uh, I will take I will take a few questions from you. All right, 
no question. It's a lot of fun, right? Very visuals, lots of colors. That's what we are doing in technology class. All right, thank you so much for your time. All right, and we will now move to Dr. Goins. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Villano, who um, puts these on for the last three years for having me come back and uh, present about my research. So thank you, Stephen, and to Dean Schwartz, wherever you're at. <laughs> Uh, for uh, allowing these to continue uh, for us as faculty to present our, our, our research. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Lee Van Horn, who was the dean at the time that I received my Curricular Innovative Award uh, for, for making that, it was her vision to have these, where faculty would receive funding in order to present their, their scholarship and their uh, curricular innovations. And I big shout out to the rest of my class that's still here, my field class for coming. Thank you. Hope the food was really good. You know? I got y'all's back. I'm thinking about y'all. Um, what I was going to present was back in spring of last year, I received uh, a curricular innovative award in order to get funding to travel to an aging conference that was in Vienna, uh, the University of Vienna uh, in, in Austria, uh, to present a scholarship that had kind of come from my dissertation about two, three years ago. Um, and as you can see, I did an exploratory um, uh, study. Um, my background is geriatrics, and when I was in practice, I was in practice over 20 years, I'm still in practice because I work for a home health agency on the side as their social worker. What always mystified me was that, why aren't more people working with older adults? It's one of the fastest growing populations on the planet, but it's like people shy away from it. And that always kind of bothered me. Then when I got into academia, I saw the same thing, this kind of shying away from anything geriatric. and. Um, so I'm going to kind of address the geriatric side. We have folks presenting about uh, teenagers and youth and all that. So I'm going to kind of give you the, we'll have the full spectrum here. Um, and so what I realized was that with the current older adult population right now in the country, it would take 70,000 social workers trained in geriatrics to take care of the needs of that population. Anybody know what percent of that we have right now? What would you say? 10, thank you, you get a gold star. 10% of 70,000, okay? And so I started thinking, ooh, that's not very good math for older adults, right? And we all are gonna age, by the way, so no matter how young you think you are, well, age, well, nobody can age like you, Kevin. I mean, you're, you're the man, all right? He's GQ man, so he's gonna age very well. But anyway, um, look the way he dresses, no, anyway. Um, but no matter how much, you know, we shy away from aging, it's going to get us at some point, the longer we live. Um, but I started looking and thinking, you know, social work can't do it by themselves. We need to reach out to other disciplines. And so I started thinking, well, let me just do a study with another discipline that's also seeing a rise in this population. And I started thinking about criminal justice because my background was in elder abuse. I was a supervisor of an investigative unit for 10 years with Adult Protective Services here in Houston. I was an investigator for nine and a half years, so I thought that's a good place to start because I always got along with uh, criminal justice folks. I said, well, let's see what they're seeing as far as aging. Are there gaps that they're seeing? Is there, maybe they need some help or, or, or some guidance or some direction and consultation about how to work with older adults? And it, my research really took me around, down an exciting rabbit hole. I mean, um, when I started like looking at what criminal justice was seeing, it, it was really amazing to me the areas where they encounter someone who's an older adult. And I'm just going to read some statistics to you really quick. Uh, by 2060, almost 98 million older adults in the U.S. will be 65 years or older. Now, specifically to the criminal justice population in the U.S., it is aging at a faster rate than the total U.S. population. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons reported 2.7% of its population is 55 years or older. Uh, some of you may not know, but in the criminal justice system, you are not considered elderly at 65 like most of the community. 
they set you as an older person at either 50, 55. Does anybody know why that would be? That and also you're 10 years chronologically older than you are because of the past life experience people have and something about prisons makes you older. Uh, it's not the happiest of places in there. A lot of these folks have had really hard backgrounds and really hard lives. So you see that uh, 10%, uh, well, excuse me, the 10 years in there. But since 1990, the older adult populations in prisons has tripled. Uh, the age of the geriatric prisoner is considered 50 years old as opposed to the community age, like I said. Some of the factors contributing to this, this influx of older adults um, in correctional facilities, mandatory minimum sentencing laws, third strike legislation, truth and sentencing laws, uh, more arrest of older adults and longevity in life. Um, so what this told me was this is definitely one population that's going to need a lot of help. And once they do get out, they're going to be depending on the same resources that those out in the community are uh, depending on. But uh, in TDCJ, which is the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, they're responsible uh, and they have jurisdiction for all people tried and convicted of crimes in the state of Texas. And currently the prisons in Texas are like, uh, half of those are aging in place. And so why should I care about that? They did the crime, now they do the time. That is the response that I've gotten from people when I've talked about this. Uh, I have people get very quiet when I tell them what my dissertation was talking about. It's like, lock them up, throw away the key. Um, as a social worker, we believe in the humanity of people. Uh, I have had clients when I was a social worker in adult protective services who had felonies, who had misdemeanors, uh, who were sex offenders. One of my home, home health agencies I was working for two years ago sent me to a sex offender home and didn't tell me. And not that that would, would have upset me because I have worked with individuals who were sex offenders and I, and I don't discard what they do. But when I went into this home, all these guys had, were in wheelchairs, walkers, and it didn't hit me until I saw the sign that said warning on the outside and a rotor rooter man came in to sit, fix the plumbing and saw me there as a lone woman with these guys and had this look of alarm on his face. I was like, where am I? What is going? And I'm, you know, it's adding up and then ding. One of my client told me where he was before, and I was like, okay. It would have been nice to know that, but my agency didn't know that. So I, as soon as I got home, I looked it up to see what I was dealing with. Uh, but all I kept in my mind was, and the, what the guy did was very bad. Don't get me wrong. What a lot of them in there did was very bad. Uh, but the only image I could get out of my head was this, he was, had dementia, he was on a walker. He couldn't even tell you what he did. And so people are gonna see this both ways. So what does this have to do with this grant? Well, I went to Europe to present this and uh, I kind of wanted to see, you know, what are other people seeing in this field? Uh, are they seeing the aging population in the correctional systems? Um, and when I gave this presentation, I, I had a lot of feedback. I, I met a, a professor from Chile who was you know, working with older adults with dementia. And he would say, when I was talking about, you know, compassionate release for some folks who are like in their 80s and 90s, he said he thought that was an excellent idea. Uh, but he said, like, they have dictator regime officers that are like in their 80s and 90s who did really bad things in Chile. And he says, now I wouldn't want them to be released to the community because, you know, they did atrocities towards humanity. He said, but yes, he says, I think we need to change our policies on compassion release for a lot of the older adults. And so um, I asked criminal justice faculty, what kind of things do they think we should consider when uh, we're working with older adults in general populations and correctional? And they, they saw the gaps for them as being skills, with skills, training, and how, this, how society views um, older adults who are in the prison systems. Some of the recommendations that they made um, regarding the skills deemed necessary and needed for working with an older adult in the criminal justice systems are those related to policy, healthcare, compassionate release, um, employable skill, skills for older adults. Uh, some of the, the criminal justice faculty I spoke to for my study said how a lot of these 
folks, men and women, get out, they don't even know how to use a cell phone. They don't even know what a cell phone is. They don't know how to look for work. And sometimes they'll commit crimes to be put back just so they're with other people that know what their experience is. So they'll literally commit crimes to go back. Um, policing issues, um, kindness shown to the incarcerated older offender, crisis management skills are needed. Uh, when I asked them about training, 10 out of 15 said that they had no training at all working with this population. Um, also some of the societal views is to view an older adult as an older adult and not as somebody who did something really bad. Um, you know, reaching that humanity in them. Um, and so some of the ways I collaborated uh, with criminal justice faculty um, is suggesting that we have programs here in Houston where uh, Dr. Judith Harris does the reacclimation program for folks that are coming out of incarceration. We envision doing that for older adults in our jails and prisons since there's such a huge population for that right now. We're also talking about doing trainings maybe with the personnel and staff there so that we can build a workforce that's gonna be sensitive to older adults in and out of the community. Uh, so wherever you lie on, you know, let them rot, you know, cause I've had people tell me that we're still dealing with people that we, you know, as a state, have taken responsibility for. And so we, we need to show them that respect. Um, some of the ideas that uh, the other folks taught me, uh, somebody from uh, Japan uh, wants to work with us about coming up with research, how we can work together to teach skills to students in the classroom in order to work with an older adult, whether it be CJ or whether it be in social work. and. Um, and I, we've already kind of started here at the university where we have a certificate, a uh, master level certificate for social work and criminal justice where we can work together and uh, reach out to populations and help build a workforce that's going to be sensitive to, to older adults that are in the correctional system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goins. Questions for Dr. Goins? No questions? Y'all need to stay. So what, what do you feel about, about compassionate release for uh, older Americans, older folks who have committed crimes? What, what are your thoughts? Yes. I think it would be a good answer to the judiciary system that we have here. We probably all, or most of us know that we have a lot of issues going on currently with the judiciary system and we're trying to figure out different ways to fix it. One of the main issues is the amount of people that are incarcerated right now. We just don't have the room for them. So with compassionate release, I see that as a really good opportunity to free up some space. I mean, honestly, what is an elderly person going to do? And if they do do something, they're just gonna end up back in jail. So I think that compassionate release is a good answer to that. Anyone oh. else? Thoughts? Yes? I'll come back. Um, so how, how would new legislator, late legislation be implemented to allow for people not to slip through the cracks? Like um, the example from the uh, professor from Chile, you know, he it was very, very, he seemed like he felt very strongly about not doing compassion or release for, for certain people. So how would policies and, and legislation allow for making sure that like, people like that don't slip through the cracks? Uh, I think you'd have to do a review of what, what the individual did. Uh, the first person that pops in my mind is someone like Charles Manson, who did some horrible things. Uh, but, you know, at some point you age out of crime. And so I, I think you'd have to give consideration to what the crime was that they did. Um, you know, are they in there because they're on a drug felony? Did they kill someone? Um, I've actually talked to some of our criminal justice folks about that. It's, it's, it's a very slippery slope and I understand what you're saying, but I think we could start there and look at the facts like, did these people reoffend? You know, how long have they been in there? Uh, one of the faculty I interviewed said there, when he was a correctional officer in a prison, 
uh, here in Texas. There was a man there who had been there 50 years. Nobody ever knew what he did. He would like volunteer to do sweeping and things to kind of keep himself busy, but he would never tell anybody what he did. And that correctional officer shared with me that, you know, what could somebody have done for, you know, to get that kind of sentence? So he had been there since the 20s when he was a correctional officer. And it's like, had he done anything else since then? I don't know what he did, nobody ever knew. But it's like, you know, in terms of that, do they reoffend? So I think uh, it would be a lot of factors you would have to consider uh, when it comes to policy. Uh, some of these laws were made during a time where uh, it was very strict sentencing. I think that needs to be looked at. And, and you know, I, I think when people hear law, they think it can't be changed. Well, why can't it be changed? Uh, you just have to look at different factors. And I don't know if that even answers your question. But, as, but what, back to what you were saying, uh, uh, the young lady over here, um, medical care and costs for the populations are disproportionately higher than those represent, represented in the facility as a whole in correctional facilities. And offenders over 55 years of age have had three times the encounters with medical staff than those at 55. So it comes to a point, these folks have medical issues and are, are, you know, it's costing the system a whole lot. And we shouldn't look at that, but one of the things policymakers look at is the money. So I think that's another argument or another way to get policymakers' attention that in the long run, compassionate release or letting someone go who uh, hasn't done like horrific atrocities towards humanity needs to be considered as far as policy changing. I don't know if that makes any sense. But. My question is, are these people coming out like uh, they have Alzheimer's or whatever's going on when they turn old? Are they coming to their families or do you just have a place for someone like, for different people like this to live under one roof? Well, a lot of times these folks uh, have been in prison so long, they don't have family to return to. Um, or the family that they do have are not able to take care of them. Um, and they're gonna, they'll be depending on the same resources and money that exists out there with the general elderly population. And so they really, they really have a lot to deal with when they get out. And so it, I, I think that's something that we need to look at, you know? I mean, is a halfway house the best place for somebody who can barely walk from the bathroom to the kitchen? Uh, and, and some of the jails and prisons are already doing assisted, they're adapting for this population. So we've got aging in place people that are elderly in the correctional system. And so they're kind of ad hoc nursing homes now. So, you know, again, what did they do? You know, can that, can we look at that and see if that can change somehow? All right, thank you, Dr. Collins. And we will pass the mic to Dr. Buckler. And Dr. Buckler is going to talk about constructing police citizen shootings. He did an analysis of coverage in the Houston Chronicle with his student, Crystal Casas. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Want to talk a little? Well, actually, let me let me start at the beginning. Um, I just wanted uh, to note real quick, Crystal, um, my graduate student here, or a graduate student in our program, not my graduate student. Um, she actually was enrolled in the first undergraduate class that I taught uh, at UH downtown in spring 2015. Didn't know that until I had Crystal in uh, my research methods class. Um, as a graduate student, and one of the things that I like to do in class, start out first day, um, is ask questions in terms of what are you interested in. And one of the things that Crystal said that she was interested in is media and crime. And I said, we're going to get along really well. Um, so jump forward in terms of that research methods class, because that's kind of the bedrock in terms of uh, what... I have done in this project with Crystal. Um, when I was a graduate student at Eastern Kentucky University and I was thinking about doing a thesis, um, I had to learn a lot of stuff on my own. <laughs> and that's okay, but uh, even you know, downloading a data set on supplemental homicide reports, um, I w it was just kind of a freewheeling thing. I had to ask questions 
piece by piece. It was very a, piece, a piecemeal type of thing in terms of loading the data into the software, running the analysis, um, and just doing the step-by-step -step work to complete a thesis. So uh, one of the things that I've come to realize is that I don't know if this is the best way to engage with graduate students, <laughs> uh, to kind of put it out there, you figure it out on your own by you know, asking questions piecemeal. Uh, so one of the things that I like to do with my research methods class is it's very applied um, in terms of both data collection and uh, data analysis. So for instance, in, in this research methods class that I've been describing, uh, one of the things that I had students do is conduct an interview of um, professors in our department about their interest, what they, how they got into the field, how they got into academics, and various other things. And um, each student in the that was enrolled in the class then transcribed the interview, meaning they, you know, basically typed the interview up word for word. We had 13, maybe 13 students in the class, and at that point, once we had all the interviews typed up, uh, they shared all the interviews, and each student then had 13 interviews that they um, used a qualitative data, uh, a qualitative software uh, to go through and code, and that was one of the projects that they that they did. And we talked about coding. We talked about you know, kind of the research process step by step, the analysis uh, portion step by step. Um, and I think that that's be very beneficial for, for students. I hope, hope it's beneficial. Um, now jump forward to the, the project that Crystal and I uh, have been working on. Um, I approached Crystal when I found out she, you know, had an interest in media and crime and said, I have this study that's ongoing. It's kind of you know, hit a roadblock because I don't have time to to dedicate a lot of attention to it right now. And I asked if she would be interested in coming aboard. I think I had maybe a year and a half worth of data collected and uh, Crystal agreed. And I'm going to turn it over to Crystal in just a moment to, so she can kind of tell you what she did and her role in the project. Uh, but a, a brief synopsis of the project. Um, Several years ago, uh, I came to know that the state of Texas uh, passed a law that basically says law enforcement, off, law enforcement agencies, uh, when there is a police citizen interaction that leads to a shooting where a law enforcement officer or a citizen is injured or killed, must report the incident report up to the uh, Texas Attorney General's office and then they compile an annual report of all uh, citizen uh, police shootings that happen in the state of Texas. Um, and they also provide the incident reports uh, online at their uh, website. So that's kind of the starting point for our study. And the reason why that is important, at least to me, is a lot of the studies that are out there that look at police citizen shooting and, and how they're covered in the, in the mass media, uh, they start with what is in the media. I don't think that's a good starting point because media don't always cover every shooting that happens. Uh, here, we had a data set that we could say, okay, this is all the shootings that happened in Texas, and then we narrowed it down to uh, Harris County. And that became the starting point for then collecting media on all of the shootings that had happened in the various jurisdictions in Harris County. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Crystal and she's going to tell you a little bit about what we did to collect the media uh, data uh, for the study. Hello everyone. Uh, so my part in this study was basically uh, data collection so I basically went uh, to look through Houston Chronicle articles, uh, Houston Chronicle articles, and um, I used the information gathered from the events, um, and I kind of just matched them, and I collected. Okay. <laughs> and I collected them from, I believe, 2016, 2015? 2016. 2016 on until 2019. Um, and that was my role in there. <laughs> 
I just did the most of the research and data collection. Um, So, so one, of the, one of the things that I think is beneficial to something like this, doing research with a student, is it, it speaks to the difficulties that you come across when you're collecting data. For instance, you may think, okay, it's, it's an easy thing, right? You have all these articles and they're all relevant. Well, some of them we decided were not relevant. We, we would hit a wall in terms of, okay, uh, does an article that references a particular case where they were doing a, a benefit to raise money for the victim's family, does it really speak to the, the thing that we're trying to get at? So we had to walk through a process then of saying what is relevant and what's not relevant. And that took discussions. We, we met, how many, oh, over the course of this data collection we met a lot of times, through, you know, afternoons when Crystal would get off work and we would sit and we would go through these articles and say, okay, this is clearly relevant because it's talking about the investigation component. This is clearly relevant because it's talking about this. But what is not relevant? Um, and that's a big part of data collection and analysis is figuring that kind of stuff out. Um, so I, I think that the applied approach that we took is, is again, very beneficial. Um, I'll speak briefly to some of the, some of the findings that we had, uh, looking again at 2015 to 2019. Um, one of the things that we found was when you have uh, white uh, male victims, they are significantly overrepresented. Well, I won't say significant. They, they were overrepresented in terms of the number of articles published and the number of words dedicated uh, to those types of events. And the reason why words is important is it speaks to the intensity of the coverage. So we were looking at A, what's covered, and B, how intensively is it covered. Um, we also found that in terms of Hispanic male cases, they were very underrepresented. Uh, they represented, I think, 23% of the event data. The in, in other words, the, a Hispanic male was involved in 23% of all of the events that we were looking at, but they only made up 8% of all of the total number of words that were published. So with regard to the Houston Chronicle, there was, there was a tendency to not dedicate a whole lot of attention to cases that involved Hispanic uh, males. Um, we also found, which doesn't surprise me um, at all, um, there was more coverage uh, of um, events that uh, involved, um, actually there was, a, there was a disconnect in terms of whether the suspect had a weapon or not. Uh, media overcovered. Uh, those instances where the uh, offender did not have a weapon. So I think the takeaway from this is in terms of looking at local coverage, you know, we get wrapped up in the, um, you know, all the things that are going on with regard to the national media, but it doesn't really give a, a picture of, uh, I think, what's, what's real. And when you, when you start looking at a local jurisdiction looking at the instances that happen here, looking at local media coverage, you get a possibly more um, comprehensive understanding of what's going on in terms of does media repre adequately represent a reality of a particular social phenomenon. Time's up, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. <clears throat> Any questions? You have another question? Okay, what's your question? He stumped you last time. I, I don't know if did, I want his question. Uh. Can't think of it? I, I have one for him. So, Dr. Buckler, are you, did I understand you correctly to say that the Houston Chronicle underreported incidences of Hispanic males? Yes. Males? 
They are 23% of the 120 events in our data set, and they made up only 8% of the total words published in the articles in the database. Yes? So they're publishing it, but they're just not saying much about it. Is that correct? They're, they're underrepresented in terms of publishing, but they're more underrepresented in terms of the intensity of the coverage, in terms of the amount of... What do you... Oh, and what can you imply from that? I don't know. I mean, it could be it could be a lot of things. It could be readership. I mean, mass media, uh, when they um, when they you know do their thing, uh, they're always trying to speak to their readers. Um, they may have data suggesting that their readership is more Caucasian, more white, um, and that may be why they're speaking to those cases more. Uh, the idea being that uh, what what impacts your readers, they'll be able to grasp and understand and identify with, um, and things that don't impact them, maybe not so much. Um, another possibility, I think, is when you, looked at, when you look at black males, um, they were pretty much represented and in terms of the event case, event um, data and the media data pretty evenly. Um, there could be something going on in terms of a national media effect where that, because, you know, um, for instance, if, 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 the, if the majority of the readership in the Eastern Chronicle is Caucasian, that doesn't then explain that. Uh, but it could be that they are keeping up with what's going on nationally in terms of these cases that are being uh, shown and, you know, have time dedicated to them nationally. Uh, and, you know, there's this perspective out there that some of the national media is also ignoring Hispanic males when you when you look at these cases. So it could be a variety of things, I think. Interesting. A couple well, of guesses. Very much. Thank you. Yep. And last but not least. Definitely not least. Definitely not least is our own Dr. Gilmore. Can we have dimmed lights? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, before I get started, so I'm the person that told you earlier, I'm going to stand over here, um, but if you could not fill my PowerPoints, please. And then uh, for people in the audience, um, I am presenting on, wow, okay, that's really, that's cool, it's cool. Um, I am presenting on, um, I thought you were going to pull my PowerPoint up for you, what kind of MC? Um, <laughs> so... Um, so for, uh, for people in the audience, um, just I would appreciate if you didn't take any pictures on your phone um, of my slides because they are, um, there are images of actual human remains. There's nothing um, that is beyond skeletal remains, so it's bone remains, so okay. Um, okay, all right, so I'm gonna come this way though so you don't capture that way, is this good? Okay, cool. All right, so um, I got college funding to attend a human remains recovery course that was taught at uh, Texas State. So Texas State has a forensic anthropology center, or FACS, um, and every year they host um, a course where people can attend to learn how to recover uh, human remains. So um, for those of you, if you're not familiar with the FACS program or kind of what they do, there is a 26 acre campus that is um, a research facility associated with Texas State in San Marcos and it's on Freeman Ranch. Um, it's one of seven in the United States and it's the largest in the world. So, you know, Texas, like Texas does it big, right? And so they're the largest in the world. Um, and they have this kind of, I feel like I'm, what am I doing wrong here? Like, is it me? It's just me. Okay. Um, they have this, um, you know, anthropology research center where they study human decomposition over time. So people will donate their bodies to Texas State, um, and um, we will watch in a controlled environment how those remains decompose. Is it driving crazy? Yeah? Okay. We'll switch it up. Okay. Um, and so it's really important in an investigative this working? Yeah, okay. It's really important in an investigative capacity to study that, right? Because sometimes, unfortunately, in criminal justice, we will find human remains, and we're trying to get an idea of post-mortem interval, how long it's been since that person has uh, died. 
and if we can study that in a controlled environment through donated remains, right? So we can study that um, over time. It gives us a really good idea of how bodies decompose over time. Okay, um, and so uh, just just kind of to know how important this is. So Sam Houston in Huntsville also has uh, a human remains uh, area where they study decomposition over time, and the different findings between San Marcos and and what goes on in Huntsville, which are both located in Texas, are significant in terms of how bodies decompose in these different areas due to um, flooding, due to different animal activity, due to different aviator activity, um, and all sorts of things. So even in within one state, there's vast differences. And so this, this type of research is really important. So I went to this course. It was a five-day long course. Um, and I have incorporated information that I learned in this course into two classes that I teach quite a bit here, uh, one in death investigations and one in criminal investigations. So I'm going to show you some pictures of kind of what goes on out there. So it was really hot. Um, it was really buggy and there was like a lot of snakes. And so even though we're in like full, like long sleeves and everything, it was because um, it, it was it was, uh, it was a really rough environment out there. So the first thing that we did was we, we had to do line searches. We were looking for, um, we, you have to find, even though they have them marked, like they know where the locations are, uh, you have to find and locate with your team um, a grave site. So um, here was the site that we picked. In hindsight, I would have never picked here uh, because, or, or I would never would have went for this one because we were surrounded by really sharp thorn bushes. But we can tell um, that this is a grave site because if we look, you can see a lot of differences in vegetation. Like, do you see how in the middle, like the grass is a different color, it's a different height. Uh, there's different types of vegetation here than there is in the surrounding areas. And there's, do you like those flowers? I like them too. Yeah, I had to cut them down though. Yeah. So. Um, so, and there was also a depressed area in the ground. So, and it was very nitrous rich, right? Because we know that when bodies are buried, they decompose and then they give off this nitrous rich purge. So uh, that's what you're seeing there. Okay, so then uh, there's a ton of measuring involved in this. Uh, we had to set up a grid and measure everything. So we cleared out our vegetation and set up grid. Um, here we are kind of cutting and clearing everything. You have to do this like really carefully. This is a process over time. Um, you want to make sure you're not disturbing anything or missing anything. So we had to cut all of that really high vegetation down. So this is the same location, just all kind of being trimmed down. Um, here was our grave prior to start. Um, and you know, all of this is zoned in with X and Y axes um, to, to kind of measure the location of everything. So this is how you get a start. And that white ruler there, we always indicate northern direction uh, whenever we do this. So um, okay, moving forward, there was a lot. There was a lot of digging, uh, three days worth of digging in very hot sun. We want to try to preserve the skeletal remains intact um, as much as we can. So there we are digging and digging some more and digging some more. Um, that that uh, the kind of fright front right area of the screen, you can see kind of like something sticking up that's not a tree root. We actually had an exposed tib fib, which are um, which are bones within the leg um, upon get, getting to the site. So that's kind of unusual, but uh, very interesting. Here we are digging some more. Um, and you know, it's not like you would see on TV, right? Where they like bring in, you know, like some, some really expensive digging tools. Like you're using little tiny shovels and dustpans because teeth fragment, bo hand bones are really small, foot bones are really small. And so, um, so you can't just like chunk a bunch of stuff in. And all, every single, piece of dirt that's taken out of that site is sifted as well. So uh, we got to do that. Um, here we are mapping in some stuff. So you do an X and Y axis as well as depth. So um, you're marking all of that. I think I have some drawings of um, some stuff we did. This is our initial um, evidence that we saw prior to even beginning to dig that on the right is an exposed tib fib. And on the left is um, the first part of a big toe bone. So that's what that is. Um, OK, here is our remains as kind of they were found. So this is really important, right? So 
when we have a shallow grave site in criminal investigations, we need to know how to best recover those remains in the position that those remains were found, because that can give us a lot of really important information, right? So, um, so that's really important. So this is how, when we first kind of had some initial exposure, um, what, what the reserves remains looked like. Then we had to map all of that in. Um, and again, this is kind of blurry. Let me see if I have a better. See, this kind of gives an example of we have to map over time over a grave depression. And then this is we have to map in all of those bones that we have. So the depth of where they are, again, that can give us um, a lot of really important information um, related to remains. Here is kind of a backward view of, and this took us three days as a team, and I'm told that that takes about that amount of time. Uh, he's excited, he likes it, it's cool. Um, I'm told that it takes typically about that amount of time um, with a team working in a shallow grave to make sure. So that's about on point for how long that takes, which like, they don't show you that on CSI, right? Like you're gonna be out in the sun for three days, you're gonna be black and blue, there's gonna be scorpions on you. Um, and it's gonna take that long to uh, excavate remains, but that's, that's how long it takes. We did take a, like a, so that, that was my whole team. So that's the group of people I worked with. Um, you do take a picture of your remains on a tarp. This is uh, kind of a quick picture. It was raining on us, so it was tough. Uh, but you wanna kinda do a bone inventory to make sure, again, there's lots of small bones um, that can get lost, hands, hand bones, teeth, uh, you know, those sorts of things, uh, metatarsals, stuff like that. Um, you always take a picture, too, of your empty grave site. So, um, so that's just a picture showing the ground underneath because that's also really important forensic evidence. Um, again, here's our kind of bottom of our grave site. Everyone was really exhausted, as you can imagine, by the time um, that this happened. And then I just always like to thank, um, you know, we had, this is uh, also, you can see us sifting here, but I always want to thank the people that worked with us. We had lots of students um, that volunteer there. This, this guy's name is Nate, the guy in the blue t-shirt. He was very patient with us because every time we were sifting, we had to say things like, is this a bone or a rock? Because um, you'd be surprised, uh, you know, how, how much they look alike sometimes. So, and then our team leader um, was the, the woman in the, uh, she's in the burgundy shirt on the, on the right picture and she's in the teal shirt on the left. Um, again, just super, super patient with us. So um, this course was super helpful. Um, I've never gone through anything osteologically in my career like this. Uh, even someone who's worked at a medical examiner's office, I've never done anything like this over a period of time. Um, I've already incorporated quite a bit of it into my courses. Um, and it's really, really important information for students to be able to have. And for me, having this experience to be able to then carry it into the classroom has been monumental. I mean, um, I do a lot of things now on skeletal remains in terms of what happens if we just find a femur, right? Because sometimes, um, bodies are placed out in rural areas and then there's animal and insect activity and those remains become scattered. So sometimes we don't have a shallow grave site, we have scattered osteological remains. So can we identify someone from their femur? What can we tell from someone in terms of height, in terms of sex, um, in terms of musculature? And we can actually tell quite a bit, right? Uh, same things with uh, skull, pelvis. Um, so I've been doing quite a bit of this in class and I'd never really been exposed to this. Identifying human from non-human remains, that's a big thing in Texas. Like there's lots of people that hunt and sometimes they'll just dump animal remains. And people can't tell, is that a human? Is that part of a person? Or is that part of a, a, a bear or a deer or whatever it may be, right? So um, it's really been great. I was so grateful even though this experience was probably one of the most exhausting experiences in my life to be able to, um, to get this. So I also, I wanna echo Angie's um, sentiment that I'm just, just really grateful to have this experience. So, all right, that's it. That's a good question. So um, actually at Texas State, like this is gonna sound like an infomercial for Texas State, but it's not. Um, <laughs> so uh, they get really good use out of the remains what people donate to them. And I mean that in the best and most respectful way that I can possibly um, say that. So the first thing that they do is they place the uh, decedent, the human who donates their body, right? Uh, the deceased individual in a caged area in some sort of 
uh, context. So whether it's partially shaded, partially clothed, near water, near a place that floods, you know that, right? And they watch those remains over time. Um, when that experiment concludes and most of the soft tissue is gone, they then bury those remains and they mark, obviously. So we weren't sure if we had a grave site on that initial thing, but they know where all their grave sites are, right? And they typically have um, remains in those grave sites between two and four years uh, before they, because they want to allow vegetation to grow, and they also monitor how that vegetation grows and nitrous purge in that area. So they're doing like all sorts of experiments with, um, with soil and plants and all sorts of stuff too at that time while the body is um, underground. Then they let teams like us come in and excavate those remains under the guidance of forensic anthropologists, right? And then, so that our body had been there for three and a half years. It was, um, it was a 2016 case uh, when it had been buried. And, um, and then those remains are then cleaned appropriately and they're stored on their site so that when students come in, you can also look at osteological remains just in a case. So those remains are all put in one singular uh, unit and you can take them out because everybody looks different osteologically. Like you would just be shocked at how the variance is between three um, African-American women in their 60s. You would be stunned at how different those individuals can look osteologically. So the more remains that people are exposed to, the more that they can see those differences. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so typically their, their decedents are buried between two to five years, but ours was three and a half. That's a good question. So there was just, it was just bone, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, professors. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And this is, unless there's any other questions, this will conclude our evening. Thank you.